well as authors, Mr. Navteet Sarna. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about us. We go way back. But before that, I just wanted to say that he holds the unique distinction, and correct me if I'm wrong, Navteej, of being India's longest serving spokesman for the MEA. I think he served for six years or so. Uh, and that's, that's a fantastic record. In addition, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't think of anybody else who is India's ambassador to three of our most important, should I say, uh, uh, you know, strategic countries. Uh, you know, with which India has a tie. The United States, of course, the United Kingdom, he was High Commissioner there, as well as, uh, you know, the Ambassador to Israel. And I think it was in his tenure that our strategic relationship, our cultural relationship, and our diplomatic relationship with Israel was actually ramped up, you know, from being, you know, on the back burner for so long. Uh, so his contribution, uh, you know, to India's... Uh, you know, diplomacy is, is really unparalleled. And in addition, one of the best compliments I heard about you, Navtej, was from one of our fellows, you know, who is, who is a great fan of your work, your, your books. And he says, That's... you know, what do he told me. Unka prose jo hai, gadya ekdam kavita jaise. He writes, uh, I mean, uh, what, what I was told is that he writes, uh, his his he writes poetry in prose. That is his prose writings are they flow like poetry, you know. So I think this was a, a great compliment uh, uh, that uh, that was uh, paid to you by one of our fellows. I I met him on our walk on Sunday, and he said, "We're all looking forward to listening to you." I just wanted to say a word about this series, which was meant to try to calibrate and understand, you know, India's position in the changing world order. We've heard from, uh, you know, the Prime Minister and several others that this is not just a crisis for India, but also an opportunity. So how can we position ourselves in this changing world order? And uh, we heard from uh, Lieutenant General Atta Hasnan on uh, Friday that uh, we have to replay this, uh, you know, multipolar world uh, in such a way that, uh, you know, India comes out actually stronger in the process. And uh, we discussed uh, China at great length, and we saw how uh, the challenges that China is posing us in our own neighborhood and how, uh, you know, India has also reached out to the U.S. at this crucial juncture to try to counterbalance this, uh, this pressure that we are facing on our borders not only in Ladakh, but also uh, in Nepal, you know, and so on. So we have to understand what is happening uh, in the world around us. And uh, uh, are we, for example, on the brink of a new Cold War? And is it really the case that somehow the United States as a, as a superpower has thrived on Cold Wars, you know, having a well-defined enemy somehow gets them to get their act together? I mean, I witnessed a bit of it when I was in the US and Ronald Reagan came to power after a wonderful, very kind Southern president, uh, Jimmy Carter, with long uh, lasting relations with, with India. His mother, Lillian Carter herself, had come to India and so forth. But uh, after the Iran hostage crisis, you know, the, the mood in America was uh, that they did not really want a, a president perceived to be weak. And Ronald Reagan came at that period as a Hollywood actor, not even such a well-known actor. And he completely transformed the United States. And you might even say won the Cold War with the USSR. He brought down the USSR, uh, you know, in a very complicated strategic alliance with the Pope and with Eastern European countries and so forth. And just this morning, I was reading that Joe Biden has got the Democratic nomination. So in November, we are seeing uh, you know, two, two well-defined presidential candidates going uh, to the hustings. And we also see the Floyd uh, sparked riots and protests all over the US and all over the world. So it's a very complex world environment. And uh, the question is, what is it that India can do? And before I turn it uh, to uh, Mr. Sarna, I, I wanted to tell all our friends that, uh, you know, uh, I, I remember uh, uh, Navtej, way back in the 80s, in fact, late 70s to be precise, 
when he was in Sri Ram College and was one of the top debaters in Delhi University in the circuits. He was my senior, so I always looked up to him. Uh, he was so calm. He presented his points, uh, you know, so brilliantly. And uh, he was a role model. And I might say that he always defeated me. I always came second or third. But uh, we looked up to him at that time. And I want to remember one more anecdote. One fine day, I happened to be at Bombay House uh, in Mumbai in Mr. Maligamwala's and uh, whom should I see there but, but Navtej? And uh, he had made it to a very, very prestigious Tata administrative service. You know, it was a great service. He finished his, uh, I think, his master's in law as well. I can't remember exactly. And uh, um, I, I was also in a, in a very strange situation because I was um, also trying to decide whether to take up my, uh, you know, uh, real, my heart's... Uh, desire to go abroad and do a PhD to, to be a scholar. And Mr. Maligamwala was asking me, why would you do that? Why don't you want to work for the Tatas? You know, it's a great career. And, uh, and uh, he said, uh, I, so I said that, you know, I'll go, I want to train myself and then come back and serve India. And, and he laughed and then he, there was a glass top on his table and he said, I'm writing notes on this glass top. You know, he tapped the top. And, and, and then he says, if you really want to serve, India, look at this young man, Navtet Sarna. He's joined the Foreign Service. That's what you should be doing. You know? So I remember that uh, also. Maybe Navtej has quite forgotten that. Uh, and uh, before I welcome you, I just want to uh, end uh, this, this brief introduction with a line from the Zafar Nama that you have so brilliantly translated and the Book of Nanak. I must say that uh, apart from the diplomacy and the writing, there's a deep spiritual pursuit in everything that Mr. Sarna has done. And I love these lines. They're very well, well uh, known from the Zafar Nama, and they're right at the top of his introduction. Chunkar az hame hilate dar gazast, halal ast bardan bi samsher dust. So he translated, translates it like this. When all has been tried, and yet justice is not in sight, it is then right to pick up the sword. It is then right to fight. These beautiful lines from Guru Gobind Singh, written to Aurangzeb, continue to inspire us. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Navtej, for joining us today. All yours. Thank you so much, uh, Makran. Thank you for the invitation to be here with uh, you and your scholars. Uh, and also, uh, thank you for uh, recollecting uh, in your very generous introduction all the uh, lovely associations that we have of uh, decades ago. Uh, you're right, I, I remember all that very, very well and uh, very fondly. And uh, I remember your uh, elocution besides the debating and your poetry, uh, which uh, which has marked you uh, ever since in your intellectual growth with such distinction. And so proud, proud to see you uh, heading this uh, very, very uh, illustrious uh, institution. Uh, so very, very honored to be here uh, with your fellows. I wish it could be in person, but uh, uh, the earth has to stop shaking uh, for that. Uh, so eventually it will. Uh, I, I, I thought I would make a few points. Uh, basically, since the subject that was suggested says India, United States, and the post-COVID world. So I think rather than just look at uh, the possibilities for India, I'd like to put them into the perspective of a, the India-United States relationship. I'll try not to make this all about India-US relationship because there is so much more. But I think if we take that as an anchor, uh, you know, we can probably go into a wider discussion after that. I think it's uh, a couple of presumptions here that the India-US relationship will change dramatically or can change dramatically in the post-COVID scenario. And the second presumption is that the world order is actually going to change. Or is it going to be more of the same with some 
nuanced differences. So I think these are some questions which we can examine uh, on the way. But I think the India-US relationship, we, we almost have forgotten where we were. You know, there's so much has happened in the last four months that, you know, that it is sort of, it's wiped the slate clean in a way. The embassies are shut, people are worried about going out, people are worried about getting their kith and kin back to India. Uh, all sorts of things have actually put a, uh, stopped the clock on where this relationship was in February where President Trump came. And, and it's only February, we are only in, in June, it's just not even four months yet. But so much has changed. But before I come to what Trump and Prime Minister Modi had sort of structured together over the last three years, I think it's useful to as to see where we actually were in the India-US relationship from the days that we remember. And you mentioned some of those days. I think for years and years, for the first 50 years of our diplomatic engagement, uh, we, were we were called, what, you know, there was an old Foreign Service ambassador from the United States, Ambassador Dennis Cooks, who wrote a famous book uh, which became famous in the 90s, it called Estranged Democracies. And we were, and that was the sort of feeling that we had, that sort of encapsulated what was happening uh, between our two democracies. We had a democratic cushion to uh, enable our relationship. We had commonalities, we had a lot of people traveling, we had students going, but somehow through the 60s, 70s, 80s, we were always on the other side of history than the other person. So we were looking at the world differently. And a lot of it was because of the Cold War, because we were supposedly supposed to be in, you know, although we were non-aligned, we, everybody in America thought we were in the Soviet camp. Uh, on many world issues, we ended up looking at things differently. And there was a very, uh, sort of at best what I can call an episodic uh, relationship. We had our good days and our bad days. And whether you see, you know, when, whether it was 1971 when you had the USS Enterprise sailing into the Bay of Bengal, uh, or you had in the 90s, you had, you know, differences over our nuclear policy. There was a lot of estrangement, despite the fact that we were too large uh, democracies at work. There's something began to change in the 90s. And 90s was, uh, and, and, you know, things, the world changed, really. So maybe the pandemic here uh, makes an inflection point in the world, which, which changes everything. But the last major change that we saw was at the end of the Cold War. We saw the end of the Soviet Union, we saw people scrambling to make different relationships. We saw uh, people taking a more another look from a real politic angle, and so did India. And in the 90s, it also, it also coincided with the beginning of our economic reforms. So suddenly in the 90s, there was a began a change of vision in the United States that, okay, this country, let's take a look at it. What are these guys about? And frankly, I, I always feel since I was there personally present at that time in, in Washington, that in the immediate aftermath of our 98 nuclear tests, there was a kind of wake up call. And uh, that India had actually conducted these nuclear tests. They had uh, kept it a secret successfully and successfully tested uh, nuclear devices. And then there was a lot of anger. Uh, there was a lot of uh, browbeating. There was a lot of uh, fist shaking. Uh, but at the same time, there was a newfound curiosity. There was a certain uh, that what, why, you know, and so we were going out and explaining why we had to do this. Uh, that we have two nuclear armed weapons on our uh, weapon states on our border, one explicit and one implied. Uh, we got clandestine. But nevertheless, there they are, and the world, we have been screaming ourselves hoarse for global disarmament, and nobody has listened to us. So 
and so on and so forth. A dialogue started, the famous Jaswan Singh stroke Talbot uh, dialogue, which then began a recognition of each other's concerns, uh, uh, built up a, a deeper understanding about each other. It also coincided with the IT revolution coming in India, which was of much use in terms of professionals to the US as it faced uh, uh, Y2K problems and so on and so forth. And then we had the, the beginning, the Clinton visit to India and Prime Minister Vajpayee's visit uh, to uh, Washington DC, which then started a very positive mood. Clinton was absolutely bowled over on his, on his uh, uh, visit to India. Uh, he spoke to a packed parliament. He danced with the uh, uh, village uh, women in, in Rajasthan. He, he did all sorts of things. He went to Chandra Babu Naidu's uh, cyber tech city and got a driving license. So he was, you know, given the whole, the whole six yards. So he, he uh, went back with a very positive feeling. And I think this positive feeling, if we today look back at India-US relations, there has been an upward graph for the last 20 years or so. So whether it's uh, Republicans or Democrats in the United States, the graph has been upward. There has been, there have been nuances. Uh, I think Prime Minister Bush, uh, President Bush was uh, also very, very positive. He had a very close uh, personal relationship with Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, and he actually started the whole nuclear thing by, by signing off on, on the Indo-US or starting the process and then signing off on the Indo-US nuclear deal. Uh, something which fundamentally changed the, the manner in which uh, India and the US can cooperate in terms of not just weaponry, but, but uh, dual use technologies and, and, and related matters. And I think prior President Obama also carried this on in, in different ways. I think when President Trump came to power, uh, 2016 November was when he was elected, I had the uh, distinction or, uh, you know, payment for past sins uh, to be sent to Washington 48 hours before President Trump won the election. And uh, I, I saw what a crazy place Washington suddenly became, because uh, it, this was not a normal Republican uh, government that was coming in. Uh, this was not, of course, a Democratic government. This was a, com a government coming out completely out of the Wild West. And uh, nobody knew anybody. Uh, absolute, there were no systems, there were no positions being filled. So it was a challenge for India to continue to make sure that the graph remained upwards, that President Trump understood and his, in, and his colleagues as they came into power, who were new to the game, and many of them understood the importance of India, understood where India-US relations were. And I think the story at that time, which consistently, fortunately, it was conveyed and they understood, was that here is a democracy, a democracy with which you have a long-standing relationship, a democracy which is, which is, which has a similar worldview as as the United States, a democracy which borders China, a democracy with which you have already started a decent defense relationship, and more important from the industry point of view, that here's a huge market. You have a 600 million middle class uh, coming up. Here is a, not just a destination for American business, but also a source, particularly of, of professionals. Uh, and the big American companies were, that's why very positive. Uh, on, on, on our side. So this was the story when President Trump uh, came into power. Fortunately, in the two years, the two and a half years uh, uh, that one saw personally, and now we are well into the fourth year of, of President Trump, I think broadly the upward graph has been maintained. And I'll just pinpoint some of the things on which we've been very positively converging. And these are all in the strategic basket. For instance, on defense relations. I mean, there was a time when India and the US virtually had no defense trade about 15 years ago. Now there's a trade of, there, we have 
purchased about $18 billion worth of American weaponry. At least three American aircraft are being flown by our, uh, uh, our services. You have uh, India today exercises more in military terms with the United States than with any other, uh, than with any other country. Are you, getting, are you getting me or is there something wrong? All right. So India today exercises more with the United States than with any other country. Uh, and there have been, we have signed most of the foundational agreements, as they are called, with the United States, whether they are the logistics agreement or the communication security, the COMCASA. Uh, and now we are on towards sign, trying to sign the last one, which is, which is left. So what these agreements do is that they create a web of trust that we can share technology with you, we can share weaponry with you, and be sure that this remains uh, away from so-called uh, enemy hands. So I think one was the defense relationship. The second major strategic gain in recent years has been the Indo-Pacific vision. In uh, the President Trump's administration ruled, rolled out its Indo-Pacific vision in 2017. And in that vision, India has a major role. India is seen as the other bookend between, uh, they call it, say, between Hollywood and Bollywood. So, you know, you have two democratic uh, bookends and you have these large swathe of the ocean of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, which is going to be the center for trade in the years to come, the center for energy travel. And you have a large number of countries who are looking for direction. In a way, this in, from the US point of view, this Indo-Pacific vision could be seen as a response to uh, China's uh, One Belt, One Road uh, initiative. Uh, we took a slightly different stand on, on that. But the point remains that here was uh, an entire new area of cooperation where India had been acting on its own in ASEAN uh, and, and pretty much a lot from, from the look east to the act east uh, policies. Here was a chance to now begin a convergence uh, with the United States. So that was the second uh, strategic gain and to put it uh, down on paper, the U.S. changed its famous, uh, you know, the, their largest command of their armed services is the PACOM, or the Pacific Command, based in Hawaii, which was attacked uh, during Pearl Harbor. Uh, they changed the name to indo -Pico. Now, I would say this is not just uh, verbal gymnastics. You know, it fundamentally changes the way the U.S. bureaucracy, the U.S. defense bureaucracy, the budgeting, the focus, the policy focus changes once you call it the Indo-Pacific. And that's what happened uh, in, in, uh, uh, in 2018. The other factor which has grown during the years is the Indian diaspora, which became a very important pillar of this bilateral relationship. And the, in, the, you know, the diaspora, which used to be, of, uh, which, which was almost about 4 million uh, today, was always successful in terms of uh, being professional, you know, doctors, hoteliers, engineers, IT people. But now the important thing is that they have become politically active. And they are uh, actively funding uh, uh, elections, they are lobbying, and they are present in, in the U.S. Congress. I mean, from we went from one uh, to, to four in the present Congress and one in, in the Senate, Indian origin. So I think that is another factor which has, uh, which has been uh, a strong uh, uh, impetus in, in bringing India and, and, and the U.S. together. Now, this is where we were when President Trump came to India. In, in February, more or less. And they were, these were all the positives. Uh, there was a huge irritant. And the huge irritant was trade. 
the trade because Trump has been extremely transactional on trade. Trade problems between India and US are nothing new. We've had issues before, we've had WTO disputes, we've had disputes on intellectual property rights, uh, we've had disputes on uh, you know, uh, child labor, uh, and so on and so forth for years. But now President Trump has made trade a kind of transactional issue. So, you know, for him, it comes right up there. For instance, trade balance. Now, we have a $140 billion trade between, between India and the US, and we have a trade balance in our favor of about $25, $26 billion. Now, that became such a big issue because he took the top 10 countries which had a trade balance against the US and wanted it removed. So, in earlier administrations, this this was looked away from because that was a globalized world they were looking of and negative trade balance did not necessarily mean a bad thing. And at the same time, uh, they saw the whole India relationship in a larger strategic lens. And this was given, this was came under the policy of strategic altruism that look away from these small irritants, let's look at the big positives. But President Trump was having none of that. So, that's why trade became such a big issue, the trade balance. So we started buying a lot of civil aviation aircraft. We started buying oil and natural gas. Uh, we started to reduce that trade balance. There were market access issues on both sides. And there were other major issues like data localization, um, you know, the use of uh, credit cards and, and so on and so forth, which, which were at the, <coughs> on the table when when Trump came to India. The visit went very well, as you all saw. There was a lot of bon homie, there was a lot of popular uh, hoo-ha about it. He loved the huge crowds. And, and clearly, we were at a stage where we could have got these irritants sorted out. And then, unfortunately, uh, coronavirus took over the world, and we sort of got stuck uh, where we are. So that more or less is, is where the bilateral, to give you a sort of you know, graph of the bilateral relationship in a few words over the last 30 or years. So that's, that's where we were. Now there were some trends which were clearly visible. And these are important to see that will these continue uh, in the post-COVID world. One trend was the US looking inwards. The US withdrawing from a global role. Uh, Trump had come to power on the fact that, you know, make America great again, bring the jobs back, pull the troops back from Afghanistan and Syria. Uh, don't spend on the UN and all these useless things. Let me, you know, uh, you know, we, we must get more bang for a buck. People must pick up their own weight uh, and so on and so forth. So America looking inwards and withdrawing from global presence. That's one trend. The second trend was China's rise. And that I don't think there are two uh, views about it. China was not just rising, but China was rising in a more and more increasingly in a more muscular fashion. So the OBOR uh, was a very aggressive strategy of, of, of not only president, making their presence felt, but virtually taking over uh, strategic facilities in, in many countries. Uh, China was being muscular in the South China Sea, so hence the Indo-Pacific. And it, it, it was clear that the big rival for the United States in the years to come would not be Russia, but China. Although the antipathy towards Russia remained at a fairly high level. So this was the second trend. The third trend was US-China conflict, or US-China, um, um, you know, uh, uh, a confrontation. And President Trump, though packaged it in trade terms, in terms of tariffs and, and the trade war, it was actually much deeper than that. It actually went into there was a countrywide change in consensus on China. 
earlier there had been a feeling that if we are good to china china will start behaving just like any other country and you know we'll all uh, be happy together and there was a lot of investment there was a lot of tourism there was a lot of but that sort of changed you know, over the last 3 years or so that changed it changed because there was a a feeling that china has been taking us for a ride china is robbing us of technologies um china is uh, making full making uh, undue ad taking undue advantage of our generosity in different ways and there was a, 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 a so while it there was on the surface it looked like a trade war this was much more so this is the third trend and the fourth i would say which is a spin off from the first is an anti globalization feeling now this has been happening all, all over the world in many ways but very very pronounced in the united states uh you know this not global but local you know so uh, this whole this protectionist nativist kind of thinking was very very pronounced in the us and that was one of the factors in, in trump's uh, election uh, in the first place uh, you saw it in some ways in brexit uh, you saw it in in other countries in brazil and and some european countries so there's this anti globalization trend along with it comes the weakening of multilateral institutions the un security council reduced to nothing virtually because they can't ever agree on anything significant uh, the wto being questioned uh, hugely and of course now what has happened to who uh, in in the pandemic so these were certain trends now what happens to us after this pandemic passes if and when it passes i think that that is is essentially essentially the the first question now there are two ways of looking at it one is that it will upset everything but i think more than it will upset everything i think it has upset everything to the extent that it can already economies are in disarray uh, countries are worried about how many people will die and or live rather than worry about you know minor trade issues or market access issues the likelihood is that when this dust settles the trends that i have outlined will probably get accelerated and accentuated rather than a complete toss up of the international chessboard what you'll see is that the covid will probably impact all these trends in 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 some ways for instance on the in the us if you had this look inwards it's going to be more pronounced now their economy has contracted uh, more than ever since the great depression uh, the unemployment rate there was rejoicing the other day because the unemployment rate came down from 15% to 13% and actually Pre vice president press uh, pence was on television and the stock exchange was celebrating uh because they it came from 15 to 13 but 13 is very high so they are going to not be uh you know the economy is not one that is going to open up and uh, you know bring in foreigners and let jobs go out that sort of a thing i think we are not going to see uh for for a long time the protectionist tendencies that president trump has started whether or not he comes back in november a uh, may only change uh, in degree but i think they are pretty much set uh, to carry on why also because there is a great feeling the world over and most so in the united states that you know the richest country in the world the most developed country in the world and you have uh, 100000 uh, and more debts so there is there is something wrong here and what is wrong everybody is feeling is that they have let the supply chains be extended too much everything is being made in china or the raw materials have to come from there or half the work has to be done there 
Uh, I remember years ago, 20 years ago, we used to be shocked. We used to go and buy sports equipment or tennis shoes or tennis rackets in the United States only to fly back to India and find that they were made in China when you actually read the fine print. But everything had an American name, but everything was made, made in, in, in China. So this extension of supply chains to a country with which you have a confrontation is something which people are going to look at. And whether or not they, you know, what is, I think President Trump uses the word reshore or onshore, or uh, whether or not they do it all into the United States, they'll certainly want to do it in more friendly countries, in a regionally closer. So shortening of, of uh, uh, supply chains will, will happen. So this trend will clearly carry on. China's rise is a trend which uh, I think at the moment is in a balance. Because China is already trying to be very aggressive uh, in terms of firstly projecting that we handled Corona very quickly and very well. And secondly, being very aggressive about anybody who's saying that China was responsible for it. So they are toughening their stand around the world and we are seeing it in our country. Uh, they're toughening it on the Taiwan issue, they're toughening it here, they're toughening it in the South China Sea. So this is part of the overall or, or aggression uh, of, of China. So whether or not, and their advantage is that probably that their economy being the way it is run has probably got us on its feet more than other economies have. And probably they have a head start already. What they have lost is, is a trust element. So people are beginning to say that I will not buy Chinese stuff, or I will, you know, I, I can't trust the Chinese to do this for me. So, you know, somewhere this is going to be balanced off. So the trend of China rising may slow down, at least in the short or medium term. But what will not slow down is the US-China confrontation. So the U.S.-China confrontation, I think, is only going to get sharper. So where you where you talked in terms of tariffs and all, now it will go become a wider thing. It has already been, you know, when President Trump started calling it the China virus, uh, I think that that was a, a big sign that, and this may get sharpened as we go into elections uh, uh, in November. So beyond the rhetoric, also. I think the rivalry between US and China, the rivalry in the South China Sea, the rivalry in the Indo-Pacific uh, will, 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 I think, be, certainly be accentuated in the years to come. And the, the trend of multilateral institutions weakening will also be accentuated. Because one, the Chinese are being, uh, very aggressive in increasing the influence in these institutions. Whether it is WHO, it is the, today they are the second largest funders of the UN, after the US. And while earlier they were willing to sort of, you know, bide their time, hide, hide behind the larger groups of countries, they are being far more uh, aggressive today in international institutions. So you will see uh, uh, and with the U.S. sort of sort of stepping away from this uh, leadership role, I think the role of the multilateral institutions is in serious need of repair. So I think that's is something which is going to be uh, something which we are going to be uh, looking at. Uh, the what happens in this situation, and I can come back to details during the Q and A but I want to sort of give the bigger picture first. What happens to the India-US relationship given these trends and given where we were? I think more or less once life starts again, we will, uh, the Indo-US relationship boat will find its even keel pretty soon. Because I think because the strategic logic of both of the relationship is very obvious to both countries. The democratic commonality, the possibility of economic cooperation, 
the possibility of cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, the existing defense comfort and the agreements and basic work that has already been, been done, the mutual exercises uh, and all that, the possibilities of pharmaceutical cooperation, which is, you know, in which is becoming increasingly important for the world, the possibility of cooperations in vaccine development, science and technology, space exploration. I think these are the areas on which India has a natural advantage vis-a-vis -vis other countries and in which, which the US and India relationship has already le reached levels of comfort. Uh, what may go slow in the, while, in the short while at least is perhaps defense cooperation, purchases, because of budgetary reasons. I think countries are going to be looking at reallocating their budgets more towards health, more towards domestic infrastructure. That's going to be the political call. Uh, and that's, I think, uh, it's necessary. So I think uh, some of that may go, begin to go slow, which, you know, was being, uh, was being done. What may happen is that we were buying oil uh, to offset the trade balance. But oil prices have fallen dramatically. So I think the impact of our purchases of oil on the trade balance is going to be less and less. The civil aviation industry has been very badly hit by the pandemic. And we were buying, I think there were 300 Boeings in the pipeline uh, from the United States, which would make a major dent in the trade balance. But I think civil aviation is going to go on a hold. So I think this, this purchases will also probably uh, slow down in terms of uh, civil aviation. So I think in terms of trade, we will have to find more creative ways of making sure that trade doesn't become a major problem. We should hurry up and rush and get the deals that we can. Uh, and they were pretty advanced uh, when President Trump came here. So they shouldn't be all that difficult because these aspects uh, may slow down. I think a lot of possibilities of cooperation lie in the Indo-Pacific. Because, and I'm not saying only in military terms, uh, in terms of creation of infrastructure, in terms of creation of connectivity projects, in, ter in, in terms of uh, human resource development, this is all that we are working a lot in terms of, you know, cooperating with the American Blue uh, Dot uh, Network, with uh, creating domain awareness for various countries in that area. As Chinese aggression increases, our challenge, of course, will be how do we do this without making it sound anti-Chinese? Now, that's the fine line. And that's the narrow space that Indian diplomacy uh, works in. Uh, so because we, we have China as a neighbor, we have China as an aggressive neighbor today. So we, there are limits to which we can be seen to be, uh, you know, hobnobbing with the United States on something which the Chinese perceive as anti-China. So we have to project ourselves, as the foreign minister said, we are a leading power a leading power which plays by the rule, by the rules. So somewhere we, we have to walk that fine line and that's, that's the challenge uh, we will face. I think the growth areas will be pharmaceuticals, health, uh, in investment in telecom. For instance, you've seen the massive investments by Facebook in, in geo. And a new area which is coming back is textiles not just textile export from India, but cooperation and investment in textile industry uh, in the United States. I, I think that is another area which, which has, has a potential for growth. The one more aspect, and I'll probably wind up, is one aspect which has suffered a lot because of the pandemic is the people-to-people -people relations. You know, we have a large number of professionals, and immigration was not always a comfortable place during President Trump's uh, uh, tenure. But so far, we had, you know, there had been a tightening up of the H-1B process, 
but not a winding back. Uh, so to many, because H-1B professionals are also very useful to American companies. In fact, the vast majority of H-1B professionals work for American giants like Facebook, Google, Apple, and Amazon, and not for Indian IT. So I think that is one thing which we have to see whether this can be kept on an even keel. The second thing is students. You have 200,000 students of Indian origin from India in, in the United States. They're the second largest group of students after the Chinese. Now, what is going to happen to them? Are they just going to lose a year? Are American universities going to change over to virtual teaching for a year? Uh, what's going to happen next year? Uh, I think there's a mutual interest here, both for students as well as for uh, the universities uh, to, to keep this going and, and find, find creative ways. And ultimately, I think that's also important for the larger relationship. Because I don't think, you see, we are not allies or allies, India and the US. Uh, we are strategic partners. We are not treaty allies. We are not NATO or non-NATO allies even. So we have a, a sui generis kind of status with the United States. And a lot of it is based on sentiment. A lot of it is based on people studying there. A lot of people, people having family there. Uh, a lot of, you know, uh, more than one congressman has told me, ah, yes, I love India. You know, my doctor's Indian. So that's... So there are, there, these are the elements which are particularly good for the India-US relationship. And these are some things which we have to build on. Uh, I rambled a bit, I'm sorry, but uh, you, you know, I wanted to give you as big a picture as, as, as I could. And I'd be happy to go into uh, specific directions uh, as we get questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you have given us uh, a lot to think about, a lot to reflect on, a lot to digest. I thought I would just ask a question to set the ball rolling. In fact, two questions. One is, you spoke about how India and the US are strategic partners, not allies. And in the context of the possible Cold War that might unfold post-COVID between the US and China, do you think that there is any possibility of our formalizing this strategic alliance with the US? And would that be to our advantage? Because in the prior Cold War with the Soviet Union, uh, I think India was more or less on the Russian side, the Soviet side, and yet we maintained our distance. Obviously, we had uh, the non-aligned uh, you know, policy. Now we have another version of non-alignment like multilateralism and so forth. So the first question is, do you think that it would uh, be useful to enter into uh, not just a partnership such as we have with the US along all the lines that you've uh, pointed out, pharmaceutical, technology, uh, you know, students, information exchange, manufacturing and so forth. But is it is it also a good idea to actually formalize this sort of alliance uh, without uh, riling the Chinese too much. Uh, the second question, I mean, I think you're uniquely suited to, to address, which is, uh, is there a role for our uh, growing strategic relationship with Israel in this whole configuration? In other words, uh, you know, Israel, US have a, a amazing relationship because the Jewish Americans are a very powerful and very organized group. So if you take the New York Times, they might be very anti-Trump, very liberal, but when it comes to Israel, there is no compromise. You know, whoever the president is, they're going to make sure that Israel's interests are not harmed. Is it possible for the Indian diaspora in the U.S. also to assume a strategic relationship uh, within the United States, like the Jewish Americans? There's certainly, Indian Americans are certainly very affluent today. And as you said, they are doctors, engineers, techies. And uh, they are on both sides of the political spectrum. When I was studying them, most Indian Americans used to be Democrats. And now I see a lot of them are also Republicans. So 
in other words, can we model our diasporic interventions in the US on Israel on the one hand, and, and on the other hand, this triangulation uh, with uh, you know Israel as one uh, you know one uh, point in this triangle, the US is another, and India the third one. Is there a way to leverage this in this post-COVID world order? Thank you. Thank you. I, I think those are absolutely excellent uh, questions, Makran. Uh, on the first one, I think it's, it's easier to answer. Uh, I don't think India, by nature, by history, uh, and by politics, uh, will ever consider a formal alliance. Uh, 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 even in the even when we had a treaty with the Soviet Union, uh, we had a treaty, but for peace and friendship, but we would strongly uh, resist being called an ally of the Soviet Union. And, uh, you know, we kept till the last, we kept saying we are non-aligned. And uh, so I think even if we run into a Cold War II, uh, which frankly, I don't think the world is, is at the similar place like uh, United States, uh, USSR days. Uh, this is a far more integrated world. It's uh, uh, US and China are, are rivals, but not in the same way. Uh, so I don't think we, we will, what we will run into is probably not a Cold War 2.0, but more an era of great power rivalry. So where you see US, China, uh, a rising uh, Russia, uh, perhaps a group of middle powers, as they are being called. Uh, you know, you have Japan, South Korea, perhaps India. Uh, uh, so more of a great power rivalry role. Now in this, even if we have this world, I think in India, probably it might accelerate our uh, uh, you know, uh, ironing out whatever uh, differences we still have with the U.S., uh, signing up the other foundational agreements so we have a good uh, basis for technology cooperation, exchange, maritime cooperation, we clear out the trade uh, deck so that we, we are not fighting with each other on, on trade issues. So it will be probably an effort to get more of an alignment rather than than to get uh, a formal alliance. On the second issue, you're absolutely right. The Israel-US-India relationship is, is uh, something which is of great value in both these relationships. And they play, ever since we have managed to get a good relationship going with Israel, we are now definitely that that plays into a comfortable place in the United States uh, uh, because they realize that India Israel has a good relationship. So this helps a lot in different places in the US. For instance, in the US Congress, a lot of uh, congressmen, whether they may be uh, Jewish or not, certainly have a, a very soft corner for Israel. And that helps us with India US issues. Similarly, in Israel, having a comfort that the Indo-US relationship is good really impacts on in, in Israel in very positive terms. You know, it gives them a comfort level in terms of technology cooperation because otherwise they would be going against the grain if, if they, they couldn't cooperate with us if we didn't have a good relationship going. The triangulation happens all the time. Uh, both in conversations plus in certain formal ways. We have, uh, you know, we are always invited to attend the APAC uh, annual conferences and speak there. The ambassadors, of, I've spoken there more than once. Uh, the Jewish uh, uh, organizations in the United States are very active. They stay in touch with the embassy. They, they like to meet our visiting ministers uh, and so on and so forth. So this triangulation is, is, is a fact of life uh, already, and it's very useful. Thank you. Very good. Now I'll throw it open. Uh, you can message me, uh, and uh, so I'll call on you. 
And uh, in the meanwhile, if someone has a question, just raise your hand and I'll call you out. And then you unmute your mic, please, and speak. Professor Raju, always the first on the draw. Go ahead. Well, uh, thank you for your uh, extensive big picture as you've drawn. Now let's get into a bit of the details. The U.S. is in an economic crisis. <clears throat> As you said, it's like the Great Depression. Now, given that, how is it going to impact the relation? See, are our techies going to get jobs there? Or is there going to be very intense rivalry? That is one sort of thing. The other sort of thing is, will, I mean, will the Cold War 2.0, it is there, whether you call it that, no. Will it result in the disintegration of the United States? Well, um, I think the first part of your question, Professor, I did hint at during my talk. I think the economic crisis is going to be deep in the U.S. The unemployment is high. Uh, the resistance against uh, foreigners coming and work in the U.S. is going to be high. So I think in the short run, our techies will get jobs depending on what they are going for. Uh, you know, they will need to be, if, they, if there are areas on which, in which the U.S. is interested in getting good professionals from outside and working on them, and we happen to match that, uh, I think they will, uh, the U.S. companies will make sure that they get there. But I think the days of our, uh, uh, you know, everybody just with a, uh, you know, a basic degree going there and making uh, money on computers is, is for a while, both economically and I think very important socially, going to become more and more difficult. There's going to be, given the stage, the way the U.S. is in at the moment, uh, not just economically but socially, I think there is going to be a, a, a resistance uh, uh, to foreigners, particularly in inner America. So I think uh, I would say uh, hold our horses and let people will have to have specialized knowledge and specialized uh, qualifications for being wanted by, by the U.S. companies. Uh, on, on this, in the, in the uh, second question, you said it was about the Cold War, sorry, and the specific question was? Uh, uh, is you this think, Cold yeah. War 2.0 going to result in the disintegration of the United States, given the social tension that we already mentioned? Well, I don't think the Cold War is going to result in the disintegration of the United States. I think what the United States, for instance, has, is in this crisis of leadership. Uh, and I think, uh, but the United States systems are tremendously strong. Uh, the United States Constitution is, is extremely strong in terms of how it is protected and projected, whether by the judiciary. They've got a very strong um, uh, media, they've got a very strong judiciary, uh, and they have huge assets. Uh, whether you take uh, natural resources, technological, uh, this thing, and let's not forget, no matter what China has done in the last few years, China is not a global military power. It's a regional military power. The United States is today the only truly global military power. So I think the United States is not in any danger of disintegration. Uh, they have tremendous depth uh, in their systems and they protect them very, very uh, fiercely. So what, they, what you're seeing today is a crisis of leadership. And I think that crisis is, uh, and, that's what, and that's also a kind of sense of frustration for the American people, that they have been saddled with this situation. They are saddled with the crisis of leadership. They are saddled with a failure of hand, handling the pandemic. Uh, but I think I would uh, put faith in the fundamental systems of the U.S. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Raju, uh, if you might, uh, yeah, you've already, uh, I think, uh, muted your mic. Uh, anyone else has a question? Just uh, 
uh, I think uh, raise your hands or uh, message me so that I can call you out. I think uh, uh, Professor Rajveer Sharma, would you have something to say? Uh, Professor Sharma, can you hear me? Is the audio uh, clear to everyone? Yeah, Professor Sharma, go ahead. Uh, sir, um, uh, it's really a very rich kind of a lecture which uh, Susanna has given. But at the same time, I think two or three things I would like to get uh, clarified. One, that uh, American uh, foreign policy has undergone a tremendous change under Trump. One, that Trump does not believe much in the, uh, the, uh, the UN mechanisms and UN kind of agencies, whether it is IMF or it is WHO or it is the uh, Paris uh, Convention on Climate Change, or it is withdrawing, as uh, Mr. Serna was saying, that it is rather confining itself to a national role rather than an international role, number one. Number two, the nationalist agendas are being put more, as were clearly brought out by Mr. Serna on Brexit and other things. Regional kind of political and economic institutions are emerging. Particularly, a reference can be made to BRICS and some other institutions like this, ASEAN and so on. And on the other hand, America is now trying to, uh, to, to bring in more people, uh, sorry, more countries into G7 also. So now in this post, uh, uh, you know, the uh, foreign policy change of America, what shall be the likely role of India, number one? Number two, in the post-COVID uh, situation that is emerging, is it desirable for India to make uh, the best use of the tensions that are emerging in and around uh, uh, America? And in fact, uh, as you said, that we should not go too far to, to be anti-China. Rather, I would say that India should make all out efforts to weaken China, because China does not spare any opportunity to weaken India. And also, uh, you know, the encirclement of India is deliberate on the part of China. So would you suggest that uh, India should make uh, the best use of the post-COVID situation to weaken China? And, and, and in fact, uh, 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 some kind of a containment policy should be adopted by India. Well, uh, on Professor uh, Sharma, on your, on your first question, I think, uh, uh, it's pretty straightforward. We we are great believers in multilateral institutions, and we have invested heavily in in the UN, etc. Because somehow, it, it even when we didn't have strength in ourselves as uh, uh, you know just on our own, we found uh, strength in in numbers in these institutions. So I don't think the two things for India are contradictory. For the US, yes. The U.S., as you said, is 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 walking away from international established institutions, from the liberal order that it has itself created after the Second World War, uh, and is is investing more in these plurilateral institutions. Now, for India, I think we have to play both the games. We have to be in whatever plurilateral institution we can get into. Uh, and in fact, some which we have helped create, like if we had the IBSA, we have the BRICS, uh, and we have got into G20. Now, if Trump wants us into G7 and make it G9 or 10, then we are not going to be the ones saying no. So I think we will continue to work on the plurilateral. At the same time, I don't think India can afford um, uh, to move away from the multilateral institutions. Because we we need them, we need the we need the presence of those numbers. We need whatever uh, role plat they give us a, a much higher platform. For instance, India is going to be the chair of the executive board of the WHO for the next two years. Now that is an extremely important position in this uh, context of the pandemic. So I I don't see why India should uh, uh, withdraw from these. So I think to uh, Brief answer to your first question is that we should ride both horses. The second point, I did not say that we should not weaken China. Uh, so I, what I did say was that there is a 
there is a, a diplomatic fine line which has to be played in terms of not being a clear-cut ally or a clear-cut enemy of another country uh, in, in any setting. And I think we, what we have done in the Indo-Pacific, the Prime Minister's Shangri-La speech, is a fantastically imaginative uh, kind of vision. And I think we should, we should look at that because we have said that anybody who plays by the rules of the game is welcome to cooperate in the Indo-Pacific. Now, if China is willing to play by the rules of the game, uh, why would anybody have any objection? The problem is they don't play by the rules of the game. So that rules them out automatically. But, you know, uh, India is not saying that. India said that just play by the rules of the game. By, by observe the international law for sea, for navigation, for uh, airspace, uh, respect sovereignty. Uh, this is all mother's milk. So, you know, this is fine. So, I, so I, I, I wanted to make that nuance clear. Certainly our interests, whether against any country which harms India, should be protected. We have to seek partners. If India is being threatened by a particular country, obviously we will do everything we can to strengthen our, our flank and get partnerships. Uh, so that is, that is a constant diplomatic game. But uh, I think India has the nimbleness and needs to have the nimbleness and flexibility to continue to uh, maintain good relations with all major powers. Now, this is not always easy, but then that's the challenge. That's the challenge of being India. Thank you, sir. I've got Thank a couple you. of very interesting questions, but sorry, oh. Professor Sharma, do you have a follow up? Go ahead. No, sir. In fact, uh, I think I am I am very much satisfied with the answer given. But at the same time, you know, there is still some kind of conflicting uh, attitudes and approach between the two countries. India is an anti-racial, uh, you know, nation, while America has has been following some kind of a racist policy. That is what is being said by many people. Uh, America believes in bilateralism. We believe in multilateralism. And uh, in fact, the kind of the democratic values that we seek to promote, there is a commonality uh, between America but, uh, and India. But if we go beyond America, our relations with Iran, for example, may be some kind of irritant in, in strengthening our relationship with USA. So what we have to say on these uh, kind of things? Absolutely, absolutely correct. I agree with you on everything. Uh, just as our relationship with Israel is, posit is a positive factor for Indo-US relations, our relationship with Iran is a problem. But that does not mean that India can make its relationship with Iran. What it means is that we have to explain better and more clearer, and we have to become so important for the US that they don't mind our being friends with Iran. So it's, it's, the, it's the traditional old uh, real politic game. We have to be more important. A has to become more important for B so that B stops worrying about A's relationship with C. You know, it's, it's simply that. And it's a, constant, it's a constant treadmill. It can't be done once and forgotten for 10 years. It's a constant treadmill. For instance, they know that we need energy. They know that we depend upon Iran uh, for uh, a large part of our crude uh, resources. They don't like it. But then they like a lot else that they do with India. So then they have to look away. So I think that that is ultimately uh, diplomacy. We don't agree on everything with the U.S. Uh, I I won't say that uh, you know they they have a racial problem, but look at the racial protests or the anti-racial protests. So they'll handle their protests. They'll handle their problem. Uh, we are an inspiration on uh, anti-race. I mean Martin Luther King was a devotee of Mahatma Gandhi. So we, so we, we have uh, some things on which uh, you know we we set an example. 
So I think I think we we don't have an exact match. We are not Siamese twins, but there are commonalities. Thank you, Thank you. Professor M P Singh. Uh, may I, uh, since you're in the same room, uh, Professor Singh is a, a great expert in uh, political science and uh, also on Canada. I don't know if you have uh, Professor Singh. Would you like to come in? Uh, at this point, or, or or do you want to come in later? Uh, in fact, if external relations are not my core. That's why I didn't intervene. No problem. If you feel like coming in later, you're most okay. welcome. Just mention it to me. You can uh, mute your mic for a moment. I have two very interesting questions. Uh, one has come uh, from Dr. Alka Tyagi. And uh, she says, what are the reasons uh, that racism is still so, so strong in the U.S. when, as Mr. Sarna said, U.S. has such strong systems, including legal safeguards against racism, you know, especially after the civil rights movement, you mentioned uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And everywhere they have uh, safeguards in place, equal opportunity employment, and etc. So why is it that she's asking, why is it that racism still persists so much in the US? Not an easy question, uh, but I would simply say that a lot of things exist on paper, a lot of things exist in law. But when it comes to practice, uh, you yourself, you see them uh, being broken. I mean, it's not, uh, I mean, we, we have problems. We have similar situations on the caste system in our own country. Very often, you, you, it's, it's, you know, you have a certain legal situation, but in practice, it, it, it works out. So I think this is exactly what you're seeing. You're seeing a centuries of uh, discrimination, centuries of bias, uh, which still doesn't die out despite the laws and despite the situation on paper. So um, at some levels, it gets ignored or, you know, it's at a very low level of interaction. But when it is taken over and done in a, a police, uh, it takes the form of police brutality, then I think uh, it's difficult to ignore and, and gives rise to the emotions that you have seen on the streets. Thank you. The, the next question comes from Dr. Samson Kamai, who is from Manipur. And it's a very interesting question because he asks about the cultural relationship between India and the U.S. post-COVID, uh, especially in the context, he says, of the sustenance and growth of Hinduism in the U.S. So I think that, as I see it, at least there are two dimensions. One is the, uh, you know, stated uh, issue of... Uh, you know, the, the, you know, Hindu component in the Indian diaspora. But the other, I think the broader issue is, of course, that of soft power, you know. How important is so India's soft power going to be in the post-COVID world, especially when it comes to Indo-US ties? I think, you know, soft power has always played a very big role in Indo-US ties. So, you know, whether, whether you have, uh, you know, I mentioned uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, whether you have a Tagore, whether you have early American travelers uh, uh, coming to India, uh, a lot of which, in fact, Makrand, if I remember right, has been detailed in your book uh, on Swami Vivekananda. And you have Swami Vivekananda himself uh, uh, going to Chicago and, uh, you know, the famous uh, the impact that he had, in not just in that speech, but several other uh, appearances. So I, I think while, um, so soft power has, uh, whether in terms of spirituality, in terms of, uh, or dimensions of spirituality, whether you call it yoga or, you know, you take uh, religion as a broad, a broad subject. But I would say even more, I think in terms of India as a, as, as a, as a, as a sort of country with another dimension, is how you know uh, Americans uh, see it, and whether you take it down to the level of the Beatles coming uh, to the Maharishi, 
which also, or you, you know, you have Ravi Shankar uh, setting the West Coast on fire. So, you know, whether it's film or it's music, and then of course, now the diaspora has been a major uh, proponent uh, of the soft power. So, in fact, the U.S. is one country in which you don't have to do much to promote Indian culture. It happens on its own, you know. And um, the only thing is you have to make sure it's the right kind of uh, stuff and good quality stuff. Indeed. So, I'll also invite more questions, a couple more. In the meanwhile, if I might, I'm, I want to come back to the neighborhood and ask you a question. You know, all these years when we were tackling, uh, you know, the older Cold War, it was also clear that the Americans and the Pakistanis enjoyed a special relationship. In fact, the paradox of U.S. foreign policy was they were always cozying up to dictators while they were championing democratic values all over the world. Now, yeah. that has changed, and to some extent, you know, Pakistan has become a client state of China. Uh, and earlier, Professor Sharma mentioned uh, we are being encircled by China. Uh, and right now, we see that, you know, the Brick Road Initiative is why China wants to pressurize us in, uh, you know, the Pangong Lake area to try to get over to the Karakoram, uh, you know, into Pakistan-occupied uh, uh, Kashmir and so forth. So the question is, in our own uh, region and neighborhood, is it possible for India to forge, uh, you know, uh, given the fact that the Pakistan-U.S. relationship has weakened, especially after Clinton too, we, we saw a definite shift and Clinton came to India twice, as, you know, first, his first term, he was still very, very friendly. They tried to equalize and balance. But I think there was a definite shift towards India, or at least away from Pakistan. So is there a way we can reformulate this and maybe have a, have a special arrangement with the U.S. on the one hand, and also obviously with Russia, which remains a player in the region? They're right, right you know, uh, beyond Afghanistan, there's still Russia. The great game goes on, though possibly in a more subterraneous and less overt manner. Is there is there any scope for India to renegotiate alliances so that uh, in our own neighborhood, uh, we are not as pressured as we seem to be right now, using the U.S. as, as, a, as a partner? Well, I think... Uh... I think you're right that for years we suffered from a hyphenation. You know, uh, the U.S. State Department uh, would automatically think in India-Pakistan terms, you know. And very often uh, uh, the Pakistan uh, sort of constituency in the U.S. Uh, think tanks or bureaucracy uh, was, was pretty strong. Uh, I think this, the, as the Indo-U.S. relationship's importance grew, this hyphenation broke. And you're right, it was President Clinton, uh, particularly I recall during, uh, during the Kargil uh, conflict, that this hyphenation was definitely broken because it was realized that you, know, you have a democracy which has acted responsibly. It has not crossed the line of control. It has, at great cost, it has cleared uh, the intruders from its land. And there you had a, you had a army, you had coups, you had, uh, you know, uh, uh, Musharraf taking over from Nawaz Sharif for threatening him. And you had, you had this whole mess and you had uh, terrorist uh, uh, intrusions. So I think the message that uh, came through was very clear, and the Americans uh, got it. So I think this hyphenation has been broken. Uh, what happens is that at certain time, and that's why this is, a, as I said, it's a treadmill or a moving target. You're constantly shooting at it. You, we can't say that hyphenation is broken forever. Uh, it keeps coming back in stray remarks, in certain situations. Why? Because very often, America sees Pakistan uh, as a tactical instrument for a design it may have, say, in Afghanistan. For instance, the situation in Afghanistan. So very often concessions 
Pakistan is sort of wrenching away concessions uh, for cooperation in Afghanistan. So uh, there are these things which have to be, uh, you know, we, we have to take some of it in our stride. We have to make sure that the broader story on Pakistan, and I must say that in recent years, uh, we have had much more success uh, uh, in projecting India's concerns on terrorism, India's concerns on cross-border terrorism, India's... Uh, and, and the U.S. has realized that uh, the Pakistanis have not been very reliable partners for them, even in situations which are purely of, uh, of, of American interest. So uh, I think you're, you're right. We have to do it. We have to, A, be very strong ourselves, and B, we have to make that count uh, with our partners that, listen, these are Indian concerns and you have to uh, take them on board. And whether it's Russia, and it will all depend upon the strength of our relationship with a particular country that they will listen to us. Thank you. There's a question about uh, Joe Biden and what happens if he comes to power and he's been fairly critical from time to time, you know, uh, of India. Uh, and uh, do you think that uh, uh, it'll be uh, difficult for us uh, to recalibrate the relationship or that actually presidents come and go? But, uh, you know, the State Department and our own foreign ministry have uh, a, a much steadier, uh, you know, pattern, uh, you know, so that it won't make a big difference. So that's the question. Well, I think let's see what happens. But I, frankly, I think that, uh, again, uh, if it is a democratic uh, president, there would be probably be a change of nuance on certain things. Uh, but I think the fundamental logic of the relationship, nobody can ignore. So I think we we'll have to probably adjust our narratives uh, to some extent. Uh, and uh, we have we must remember that, you know, with whether you had Clinton or Obama as Democrats, or you had Bush and Trump as Republicans, uh, we, we've succeeded. So I think uh, we will, with no matter who the president is, but we'll have to change uh, our, nuance, our narratives accordingly. And that happens. That's, that's part of the game. Very good. We're almost at the end. I have one last question, if you might uh, want to take it. It really has to do with what you said. I think it's really crucial that the world is suffering from a leadership crisis, as you said. And isn't this uh, an area where maybe India has something to offer, not just in terms of its, uh, you know, philosophical, cultural, spiritual traditions, the way, you know, we understand our relationship with our others, you know, self and other and so forth, but also you know, I think we have a unique uh, leader today in Prime Minister Modi, and also in the MEA, led by Dr. S. Jay Shankar, a career diplomat, a very, very learned, scholarly, quiet, but very effective leader. I think that we've never seen such a close, uh, uh, you might say, coordination and, uh, and cooperation between, you know, the PMO and the MEA. Often you've seen in the past, our prime ministers themselves have been de facto foreign ministers, right? You know, going right back to Jawaharlal Nehru, even with uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, we had that. But today we have a very, uh, you know, a, a trained, uh, you know, sort of diplomatic core. And there's this talk of enhancing it. We are, we are short-staffed. I think you would know better than anybody else. I think we need to increase our diplomatic footprint, given our ambitions in the world. So can we use the quality of leadership that we have today to, to uh, you know, take, a, 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 you know, a, a, the right foot forward, so to speak, in the post-COVID environment? I think, I think there's already a realization of that. And you, you've touched upon a very important aspect of our post-COVID uh, uh, presentation, if I may call it that. Because on the one hand, we have to handle the domestic problems that we have. Uh, we have to handle the health crisis. We have to get the economy back on its feet. At the same time, uh, this is a tremendous opportunity. And in terms of the role that we can play abroad, we have already seen it. The prime minister has spoken, for instance, very early on in this crisis to, to the South countries. 
he spoke to the G20. Uh, we will be hosting the G20 in a year and a half or so, a couple of years uh, from now. Uh, we are beheading the WHO. Uh, and I security think in council, we are also on the security, security council. council. Yes, we are, we are up for uh, that now uh, for the security council, the non permanent membership of the security council. So I think these are places in which we can put forward a fresh agenda uh, forcefully, effectively, and, and India's, India's voice counts. Uh, and, you know, if you we have a presentation by the Prime Minister in, in, in one of these, uh, or by the Foreign Minister, I, I think the world is looking uh, for something like that. Because, as you say, the U.S. is withdrawing from leadership roles. China, and despite its economic clout, somehow doesn't have the, it doesn't have the moral ground, let me say. So you, so you need, you know, in, in India, and that's why in my one of my earlier responses, I said, these are platforms, uh, the international institutions uh, for India. So I think we, we need to be able to take these, we need to be able to get a clear agenda, we need to have a vision and put forward a vision for how this world is going to recover uh, from this. And there are uh, several ways and we have a lot of talent to back that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today. We hope to invite you in person, uh, either when the vaccine is made or when things uh, flatten, the <laughs> curve really flattens. We know that you are our neighbor. You have a home here in Mashobra. And we really, really look forward to your visit in person so that you can come and see the work we do. And uh, we also solicit your continued support, blessings, and good wishes. And uh, thank you again very much uh, for joining us today. I want to end with another quotation from the Zafar Nama. I mean, whenever we face uh, bullies as we do in China, you know, we always should remember that there are powers above, you know, what we see with our uh, naked eye. And I want to go to number five of the Zafar Nama. Jaha Pak Zabardas Zahir Zahur. Ata me de had hamchu hazar hazur. So, uh, Guru Gobind Singh Ji says, Beyond this world, powerful, he is manifest all around. In the gifts that he bestows, his presence does abound. So, today, uh, Mr. Sarna, your presence has really been a gift. I thank you very much, and uh, I hope we can meet soon in person. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, Makra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.